Well, this was all about protecting Saigon and the American uh, headquarters there. All of their interests were at stake. There'd been a further attempt to, by the Vietnamese to uh, uh, infiltrate into Saigon and uh, demonstrate their capacity to gnaw away at the Americans, particularly if they could uh, you know, get at the embassy in Saigon. This was uh, you know, obviously to their as a propaganda triumph again. And they were sending parties infiltrating from the north. Up until the start of 1968, the Allies were allegedly winning the war, and the media believed that. They were shocked into the realisation that it wasn't so by the Tet Offensive early in 1968. On the opening day of that offensive, the Viet Cong entered the grounds of the American Embassy and the American public saw that on television within a few hours. It was an unbelievable sight, brought right into the living rooms of every American family. After the Tet Offensive, there was uh, American intellig intelligence reports came through that there was a lot of enemy movement in a particular area 50 kilometres north of Saigon. No Australian other than the SAS had worked that far north of Saigon. It was actually an area zoned as a American area of operation. The Americans actually asked the Australians to send up two battalions as uh, uh, to keep this particular zone under control. So uh, we suddenly found ourselves in the big league uh, flown up uh, about 40 kilometres north of Saigon to be part of the interdiction of the, uh, the forces, the North Vietnamese, coming through. But when I arrived, I went to see the CO of 2RAR to be briefed on what he'd been doing. And uh, he said to me, what you've got to do is stop your companies going anywhere, stay here, there's been a change of plan, you're not going to operate from Anderson, there's some new task on and you're wanted over to see the brigadier and I met my, my friend f f who was c commanding one RAR who'd been operating with, with two RAR and he said hey what's going on and I said I don't know you're up here anyway we got into the see the brigadier and, and uh, brigadier gave us a, a very short orders group and said we're all moving and we're going uh, to, to an area and, and uh, he, he said, uh, uh, I want you and Phil to hop, hop into an aircraft and go up and, and have, a, have a look at the area and uh, just, just check out that, that this place, and he showed us on the map, would be suitable for, a, for the landing place uh, where, we, where we'll fly into. So uh, we hopped into a helicopter and off we flew. And... Uh, the chap, the, the pilot, wouldn't come down very close to the ground so we could check out the, where we had to land. And I, I said, hey, you know, we can't tell whether that's worth, you know, we, we could land there. And he said, I'm not, and it was American, he said, I'm not coming down any lower than this. And uh, so we, we, we looked at the ground and, and uh, said, well, I think it's going to be all right. <laughs> And then he flew us around the area because he didn't want to let the enemy know that we were particularly interested in this particular spot. And we had a good look around. And there was nothing doing. Everything was as calm as a... very calm up there. There was no shooting going on. And uh, so that was, the, that was the start of the operation. The intelligence said the area is active. That's all. That's all. It's an active area. The intelligence we got at, at the time, at, that was two days before, of course, when we got orders from, from our brigadier, uh, was that th there was a, a, a number of, of uh, enemy in this vast area, uh, and they, they were uh, both uh, from the North Vietnamese Army and suspected uh, there was some of the Viet Cong there. But, but that's no help to us because you wouldn't know who's there. Uh, 
close to you. The landing at uh, Coral didn't go as well as we'd have liked. We were held up because of some American action uh, further to our west, where the Yanks were having a pretty hard time of it. So uh, our helicopter support was late. These were the helicopters that were going to fly us in. The problem was the Americans were in trouble and they called the helicopters were allocated to us to carry out duties for them. So a lot of our lifts were delayed and the delays went on and on and on. The support base, strictly speaking, everybody should have been on site by midday. We wanted to get on the ground. No one likes to be up in a helicopter where you can be shot at. We wanted to be in a position doing our job uh, as soon as we could, well before nightfall, so that we could dig in against the possibility of being fired at or have mortars fired on us and so on. But the biggest problem was arriving to find that what we thought had been uh, grassland, uh, relatively low, turned out to be waist high and in some time places shoulder high scrub. It's a very busy task to set up by nightfall. Well, the last contingent did not arrive until four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the enemy we were up against were tremendous because we never knew where they were. Their camouflage, their, their, their defence areas. You could walk into one of their defence areas and, and you'd be in it before you knew you, you were there. Their, their camouflage was beautiful. They also had their tunnels where they, <laughs> they hid. Um, they were brilliant. And they had to be too because they had no air and we had a lot of air flying overhead. So we hunkered down as best we could, uh, digging rapidly. Not having their defences prepared, not being in the right position, still having uh, people positioned some 500 metres from where they should have been uh, was a recipe for disaster. And the, uh, the enemy that sat there in the trees and watched all this happen took advantage of it. It was a, a, certainly a very muddled situation because companies were moving off out of the area we knew our uh, New Zealand artillery had been put in a different location from what had been intended. Um, there was the difficulty of sort of registering the guns so that they could provide fire support in the event that we were attacked. A mistake I made was that Phil Bennett had come in with his one RAR, had come in so late, I should have gone over and seen him. But I didn't uh, because I didn't know what was going to what was really going to happen with my battalion. Um, anyway, so Phil Bennett was in the dark. I didn't realise he was in the dark. I thought he would have been told by the, by the artillery commander what was happening. So it was a mass of errors that led to total confusion by four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was, in a sense, bunker down where you are and cross your fingers and let's hope that nothing happens tonight. Well, of course, then the attack on Coral broke that night. The, the sight was absolutely horrific. The number of dead and wounded wasn't just in ones or twos, it was in 20s, 30s, 50s. Just laying there, uh, a lot of moaning and groaning of injured from both sides. That was a horrendous night for the 1st Battalion and the guns, uh, but to their credit, uh, they, they um, managed to survive the night. 